SAS Therapy. Welcome everyone to SAS Therapy, the show devoted to helping you save your most important business relationships, i.e. your customers. My name is Todd Kirk, and I'm joined today by my co-host, Casey Trujillo. Hey, Casey. Hello, Todd. Welcome to our listeners. Glad that you keep joining us. We love seeing the progress of everyone being part of this. Oh, so true. I, I think one of the things that I've been super excited about for a while to talk about is um, the the metrics that help us succeed with our customers and really being able to look internally at the things that matter most. You know, Casey, I think one of the things that's really hard is helping people really look internally, uh, introspectively at how they're doing as a business and helping customers actually get the results that they want. So what you're saying today, Todd, we're going to get deep. We're going to get honest. We really got to be vulnerable in this session. Is that what we're saying today? Uh, yeah, I think I think that's really the key. We've got to be willing to um, be pretty fearless at looking internally and 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 taking inventory of where we're actually at. I love it because uh, buckle up, everyone, because we're going to talk about monthly active usage. Todd, is it valuable? Is it the end all be all? What, I mean, I hear everybody out in the market. Some saying, you know what? If you're if you're hanging uh, everything on on monthly active usage now and you're not getting the business realization, well, you're, you're toast. I'm hearing some people say, hey, Matt, that's all people care about. Did I log, log in? If I, if I sold someone 100 licenses, did they use all 100 licenses? I'm going to get the renewal if that takes place. Todd, what are we going to talk about today in that aspect of, are we going to decide who's king or queen, the Mao, or business realization, or what, what are we going to do today? Yeah, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about the gap that exists in the minds of most people when it deals with how they think about software usage and adoption. I think too often, um, you know, Mao or monthly active usage, as you said, Casey, is viewed as this almost like a silver bullet in a renewal. So mm. if a company is using a tool really, really well. Let's say they have, you know, 70, 80, 90 percent license utilization. So a really large enterprise, I bought, you know, 10,000 licenses of your software and I've got 7,000 people using it. Well, that's going to be a pretty good indicator that the company is likely to renew, right? Well, there is a strong correlation between usage and renewal rates of SaaS, but the problem is it's a lagging indicator. So there are there are customers who can have great usage of a software application and still churn. And there are other customers who don't get great usage, but they stick around. And the real question is, why does that happen? And what are we doing right and what are we doing wrong that are preventing us from thinking about this in the right way to be successful as a SaaS company? You know, Todd, one of the things that I get kind of giggle about it every now and then is, I mean, I can't tell you how many SaaS vendors I've talked to. And as we have those discussions and I say, okay, monthly active usage, what does it mean to you and how do you measure it? The only one consistency we have is did someone log into the software? Outside of that, we have people that say, well, if they've taken four or, f four or more actions in the last 30 days, some people say one action in the last 90 days, they might even split up Mal between a read-only license and then an active license, and they have some code name for it. And again, what we're trying to bring to the table is, is you have your metric for Mal, but does the customer have that metric of Mal? And if they're managing 60, 70 different applications and every one of these applications has a different monthly active usage number, they're trying to get their customer to hit to, to hit their number. Todd, I think you're onto something in, in what you're talking about. Not, not only is it a, a, a laggard experience, but good gracious, it's so confusing for the customer and what they're trying to do. And then they get confused about what, what they even bought the software in the first place for. Yeah, you know, it's interesting because I think Mal becomes almost this, um, we think that usage is the canary in the coal mine. That if a company is using, then we're going to be, we're, if, if users are logging in on a regular basis, that means that they're likely going to win. Um, but it's a, it's a poor indicator because the if if the company is using it then it then we're we're making an assumption that they're receiving some sort of benefit from it right and that's great uh, and that's important and we we want to make sure that they're getting that business outcome we're trying to drive a business result for the customer and and usage just becomes like the closest thing that we can see to indicate to them and to be honest a lot of customers they're busy and so they make the case to their CIO or their executive mm -hmm. responsible to ensure that they keep purchasing it. They'll oftentimes make the case 
based off of like, hey, we have a lot of people using this. But there's a lot of other factors that go into mind as to whether or not somebody at the top of the business is going to determine, do we keep purchasing it? And it, it, you know, usage is only one of those indicators. But it is interesting because, you know, uh, there's there's a lot of different levels of maturity when it comes to tracking usage. Um, You know, some some companies just track if an end user logged in. Right. Right. And if I logged into an application, does it really mean that I got any sort of value out of it? And and, and login is going to be really generous. Right. So that's going to give me an easier way to make the case to my customer that, hey, somebody's getting value, like somebody logged in. Um, And sometimes that login might be monthly. That's why MAO has become such a common acronym. Sometimes it's really aggressive, like weekly. So depending on the type of application they're using, if it's something that you'd expect a person to use every single day, weekly usage actually matters a lot. Um, Some applications actually just track quarterly usage. You mentioned 90 day uh, standards. And some will divide the types of users that they track. So like as an example, uh, you might have a project management software that is uh, only, that's only some users are actually a paid license and a lot of other users are free licenses. So you might track the usage of those who are paying for a license versus a user who's getting a free license and the way that they use the application er, er, and the frequency that they use it may matter differently. But really what's fascinating is the most mature companies that I've seen don't just focus on did a user log in and how frequently did they log in, but they also focus on basic interactions that matter a lot. Uh, some companies will, will call it their, like kind of their, their, their basics or the core things that they know are going to drive the li- most likelihood that a customer will renew. Um, it could be a certain feature that they utilize. Like if it's a project management software, if they share a project board, maybe that's going to be a higher right. indicator that a customer is going to renew. Or if uh, it's a collaboration software, a user sharing a screen, right, might be a better indicator. And, and I, I do find that a lot of times if you're focusing on the interactions that a user has with the software, the types of interactions that they have, that's going to give you a better indicator of whether or not they're getting value. Todd, I see this a lot in the potential to upsell uh, different license types to a customer. So I, I'll give you an example. Um, I remember working with this one software vendor and they said, everybody's adopted our platform. I mean, everybody. We would, we'd have conversations with the field CS reps and oh my gosh, they, every time they did not want to talk about adoption at all. Hey, everyone has adopted our software. But as you looked into their graph data, as you looked into, hey, what features were they using? The only thing they were using were chat. Mm. And what was taking place is competitors were coming in and they were, they were selling a, a video component. They were sending recording components. Well, this software had those capabilities, but the CS team, their only monthly active usage was, was people logging in and at least performing one feature. Now, what happens when you narrow in on Mao? is you didn't expand the awareness of what the solution actually can do to bring business value. And because the CS person wasn't metriced on it, they didn't know they should, should try to expand that, all of a sudden competitors were coming in and stealing a core part of their business. They were still getting their normal licenses. That software vendor still got what they, they received in, in a renewal, but they were missing out on the ability to upsell to video conferencing, recording, all these different features because competitors could see that they weren't focusing on that area. So that's one of the major dangers of Mao is if you're so narrowed on just, they do this one thing and this one thing, and you're not really driving business value, then your competitors come in and they say, hey, we do all these other things that this software doesn't do, or they don't do it really well. They just throw it in and that's not really what they do. That's not their core offering. That's what that opens up to you. And Todd, I don't know if you've seen that as you've been working and building out these, these experiences for software vendors and helping them create an awareness campaign or an adoption campaign. What, what's your reaction to that? Yeah, I think, I think the, that is, can be the danger about using Mao as, as a leading indicator and a likelihood of renewal. Um, because yeah, you're, you're right. It, one of the things that it is going to tell you is that, um, that someone likes some element of your product, but you, the things that are going to renew may be totally different than the things that people are actually using. And that can let, leave you at risk as well. And, and a lot of times when I speak with, with client success managers and work with them in their role, there's this, there's kind of this, uh, this assumption that the, the, the thing that the customer really needs 
is, well, you know what? Our product is is bangering. It's perfect. It's awesome. It does everything we needed to do. The, you know, the end user just doesn't know about that or they don't know about the capabilities. Uh, so a lot of times it comes down to an awareness issue, or at least that's the assumption. And I loved your point about the example of like collaboration software. Maybe you can do, you know, meetings and chat and file sharing and all these different things, but you're only using one portion or one feature of that application and that leaves you at a risk. But oftentimes I think we failed to take another step in to the darkness, right? Like we just, we, we tell ourselves that the product is perfect and the use case is perfect. And the only thing preventing the customer from using it is that they just don't know any better or they, right. they're not aware of, of what the tool could do. And, and while, that, while there is some truth to that, right, the, the benefit of communicating the value of the application and what's possible with the application and how to use the application, those three things are going to be super impactful. But if your product is bad or there's another product that does it better – then that on its own right is not going to do enough to help you save the deal. So you can't just take it at face value, meaning if we are getting good now or if we are getting bad now, that that is the, the, the you know, kind of the, the this crystal ball that's going to tell us what's going to happen in the future. You have to take it further than that. That's why, to me, active usage and adoption metrics are super powerful if combined with the right things. And unfortunately, we're not usually willing to take that step deeper, to go in just a little bit further and peel back the peel back the layers and try to really understand what the customer is getting out of that experience. I, I, I want to double down on one thing you said, and it reminded me of a conversation I was having with Chris Douse. He's the VP <laughs> of Business Outcomes at Smartsheet. And it was on the thing that you said, the reason why people buy sometimes isn't the reason why they renew. And he said they did a study with their Smartsheet customers. Again, this is a $2 billion business, right? And they found that 50% of their customers who bought for a particular reason renewed for a different reason. So mm. again, your monthly active usage metric might be spot on, but then again, it might not be. And so you're risking a renewal, you're risking an upsell, you're risking competitors coming in. So think that's fantastic in, in how you're you're suggesting we approach that Todd now you're talking a lot about awareness for for maybe people I, I know every customer success manager here listening to to this or if you're in customer education or you're in implementation awareness talk to us you're, you're a change management practitioner Todd walk to us what you mean by awareness help help everyone and the audience kind of understand that a little bit more well you know I, I think when it comes to awareness it, it, I think the, the, they're, the, the main people think about is just do people know that the application exists, right? And that, I think, doesn't go far enough to explain what awareness is. It's not just about do they know it exists. It's also about do they know uh, the vision and the strategy and the use cases mm -hmm. of what that application is capable of doing. So the, now I know that kind of bleeds over. Awareness uh, isn't the, the only thing on that front end when it comes to communicating, uh, communicating. I said that really weird, communicating. Um, the, it's, not the, it's not the only thing that matters. It, the other thing that really, really matters is ensuring that the, the customer or the end user also has a desire to utilize the application. And the way you build a desire is help them understand what's gonna be in it for them. And, and that's not, just a matter of like, this is the tool and this is what it does. So what your message is um, has to be really clear. It has to speak to the user. It has to speak to them, help them understand exactly what they need to do. And if, if it doesn't, you're going to be in, in big, big trouble, meaning um, the, the end user is not going to be able to connect the value of your application to their day-to-day -day work, and they're less likely to see it and use it on a regular basis or return back to it. So it's really about establishing a vision, first and foremost, and fig figuring out what's the message, um, what's the strategy, what are the use cases, and then e it even goes so far as to uh, what's the distribution model. So like, how is this, how is, uh, what's it going to cost for me to get access to such and such feature? Or how am I going to distribute or give a license to my team? Or how do I get other people to use it? And if people don't know those things as well, that's going to be a really big blocker in getting them even started in the, in the beginning. So they have to see where they're going. You know, I think one of the things that's really critical in the retention cycle is it's not just about 
awareness of the app. It's about anticipated value using the application. And so you mm -hmm. want to make sure that the user can see a path forward to where they're going to go. And you know what? They get to decide even at that point if they actually want to use it or not. But we do a poor job of making sure that the user understands where they want to go. We just like basically shotgun a whole bunch of information at them. Here's a billion features. Here's what the app does. Let me post about all these all these little things. And we don't step back and pause and try to personalize the message and the vision specifically to that user so that they can connect the dots into where they want to go. Okay, Todd. So again, I'm on the sales side. So uh, it takes me a while to understand all this amazing things that you're talking about. So I want you to break it down just even a little bit more sim the simplicity for me. Um, <laughs> I just, yeah, I just, uh, let's just say I'm in CS and I just, I, I just inherited this customer. And my admin says, hey, I want to make some announcements out to our user base, to the licensed users, and let them know about this software. Now, hopefully, obviously, you have a marketing team that's assisting you in CS, or you have an education team that's assisting you. But Todd, if you had this perfect scenario, what would your first three communications look like that you would want your customer to push out to their users? What, what would maybe the first three main messages be? Hmm. So I would, you know, the, the biggest blocker is usually for users isn't that they don't believe in the power of a technology. I think it's, we're, we're kind of, we've become numb to the kind of the sales message of like, this right. tool is going to be super powerful. Um, and so a lot of times the, the value message, even though it's really important, it also comes down a lot to the particulars of what is expected to me, uh, for me to mm. do. So, like uh, in my three messages would probably include a couple of, a combination of different factors. One would be this new tool exists. It's now available. Um, what does that mean for you? And, and so that's an important element that I think we forget is we oftentimes talk about what it means for the organization, but we don't talk about what it means for the end user. Um, I actually think both are powerful though, right? Especially if you're using enterprise software, you want to know that the company wants you to use it. Uh, so having a message that can come from leadership that says, this is why we decided to purchase the software matters, but we also want to be able to say, what is the benefit going to be to you? So as an example, uh, let's say I'm in financial services and I say, we purchased a new software. And the reason we purchased that software is because we want to ensure that we're not fined as a business. Um, well, as an end user using Don't some care. new technology that's going to prevent the organization from being fined. The only moment you start to care, care about that is if the find is going to lead to you losing your job, right? Exactly. So should the message be, we're going to use this new software because we don't want to get fined. Like that isn't going to really land well with an end user. Instead, what we should be focusing on is, you know, let's say as an example that it's like where you store your cloud documents or, or, or the policy of what information is retained. Now, all of a sudden you say, well, you know, we're going to do this because it's going to help keep the organization secure, right? Maybe that's a good message you would say, but then you would also say, but it's also going to save you a ton of time and it's gonna make it easier for you to find documents or it's gonna help you to stay more connected with your customers uh, and do it in a way to where you're not opened up to risk yourself. Uh, so those now, all of a sudden, you're taking that message and you're moving it from an organizational message down to the end user. So that that's usually where I would start in that first message is, there's a new tool, this is why we're doing it, but you need to make sure that you take the steps down and and and, and connect it to the, the benefits to the end user, right? It's a carrot rather than a stick, usually is gonna be more impactful. Uh, and then after that, I would follow up with what are the things that you need to know to get started uh, timelines matter a lot. So users want to know how long it's going to take them to unlock the value of a tool because usually effort mm -hmm. is a big blocker. If they think it's going to be really hard for them, they're less likely to do something. So we want to minimize the, the perception of the effort. So uh, we want to provide training and resources, but they need to be delivered in a format, as an example, that's not going to uh, break the back of the user. Can't send them like a, here's your four-hour certification class. It needs to be, here's a couple of short videos and resources uh, that can get you where you need to go. Maybe if you can even take tailor it um, and, and branch a user and only give them the things that they tell you they care about, that's going to be helpful as well. So that- Todd, can I, can I stop you on that one? Because I want yeah. you to talk more about, this is the benefit of me and Todd working together, is we have these experiences where we share it over lunch and then Todd forgets about it. But, you know, as a seller, I'm, I, I remember everything so I can bring it back up. Sure. Todd, do you remember the conversation that you had with a financial institution and a software vendor uh, that just purchased their application? The software vendor said, oh, our software is so easy to use. We don't, you know, we just skip to these features. And, and they really show, here's where you click, here's where you click, here's where you click. 
But the feedback from the customer was, hey, they, they don't, they want to know how to send a text message in this application. They want to know how to place a call in this application. It seems so simple, but to the SaaS vendors, like, we don't even need to cover that. Todd, what was your reaction when you heard both sides? Because again, we're in this, we're in this relationship, SaaS therapy, the SaaS <laughs> vendors saying it's so easy. The customer saying we we need to simplify. Like, what was your reaction as you heard this, and how did how did you get everybody doing the same thing uh, and be on the same side of the table with that? Yeah, it, I think the the there is a, an expectation. I think, and and I I saw this so often when I do professional services back in the day, is that a lot of times um, vendors want to jump to how to configure the application, like how to go into deep settings or, you know, did you know about this like really hidden little thing that's over here? And they, and they, they, th there's this fear of being like patronizing. So I get yeah. this, right? It's a, if you put yourself in the, in the seat of the person who's being asked to train someone, if you're going to tell them something that they assume is going to come across as really basic or, right. uh, you know, then it's like, there's a fear that you're going to come across as talking down to someone. Like yeah. that should be obvious. So why would I tell you? So really it oftentimes comes down to, uh, it goes back to a messaging issue, right? Is that we, I think we, if you think your customer is dumb, then you talk down to them. If you mm -hmm. think that they're smart, you actually talk past them. And so there's this issue of, you don't want to talk down to them, but you don't want to talk past them. And what, a, what the customers are usually asking for is help someone see the whole journey from start to end. And the, the best place you can usually start in that messaging is by helping someone understand how they're going to use an application on a day-to-day -day basis, rather than getting into stuff that they're gonna go to maybe once and then never look at again. Or never, and, and, and even like being able to get into an application, um, there may be some things that you want them to take time to do, but whether they did those or not, it doesn't matter about them getting started and getting active with the application. So it's, all, it's oftentimes about timing, meaning we tend to throw everything at a user in the first interaction that we have with them, especially if we're trying to train them on something. So a lot of organizations, uh, SaaS companies will be like, here's your, here's your 50 things you got to know to get started. And that just turns people off. So it's much better to drip that out. Give them like five minutes at the start of something that has a couple of really cool tips interspersed with some basic concepts. And then in the future, you're like, now that you're using this application, now you're able to go in and say, did you know if you configured this setting, it would actually, you know, stop this notification from annoying you, or it would make this process take less time. So when you share, it matters. Uh, and, and creating that journey and spacing that out will make a massive difference on how an end user is uh, if they're receptive. And then that way you don't have to worry about talking down to someone or talking past them. You're talking to them with the information that they need at that moment. That's really the key. And Todd, I used to admire you. And I, I, I will admit when I, first saw you, when, I, when I first saw you do it, I was like, oh my gosh, this is, this is taking too long, Todd. But I remember you would run these sessions and you'd say, hey, everybody, where do you start your day? And everybody knew everybody starts their day in email, but you still ask the question and allow them to explain. And then you would say, well, how much email do you get in a day? And then you just took them through the day in a life. And so as you walk through how they work and they saw the connection, it just meant so much more to them. And I was just, I couldn't believe how well it worked. So kudos to you and how you would approach it. And then the second thing I would, I would see you do is you would just recognize the obvious is, hey, I know you have this tool and this tool and this tool, but usually we're hearing that there's a gap for executive admins or we're hearing there's a gap for executives in this area. And then all of a sudden you made the connection of the gap. And so I think those are the cool things that you're talking about. What's in it for me is meet them where they start their day and then help them understand you do have these tools. And this is why we have this tool. It's filling this gap. So they see how all of their tools play together. And you've just been a master at that. And I think that's one of the things I would pass on to, to our listeners today as you're you're walking through that awareness and communication, really, really help them see in the day of the life and really help them see how it actually works with the other tools that they're probably working with. Well, I think, I think it's really critical that you recognize the gap because, uh, and, and, and if you're, if you're willing to take the time and listen to your customer and listen to them carefully and understand their business, you'll, you'll start to see and understand where those gaps actually exist. Um, you know, there's the, 
there's the old adage of if I ask my customers what, you know, this, I don't know if this is a real quote or not, but you know, the whole, the old Henry Ford, if I, if I asked my customers what they wanted, they'd ask for a faster horse. Right. Yeah. When meanwhile he built a car. Right. And so the whole idea there is really interesting because a lot of times the way people are using tools or the way they think they're supposed to use tools, they don't realize the gap in their knowledge. And, and we have to be better as, as people on the vendor side to be able to know where a user is. What are their, what does their day look like? What are the things that are distracting them? When do they get interrupted? What are the, what are the processes mm. they use today that they take for granted that they think they're doing as the right way, but they're really doing it in a way that takes five to 10 times longer than it should. And I think one of the things that we don't do a good enough job of is driving awareness of the gap for the user. Um, and so that's one place that I would recommend that uh, that we spend time doing as, as SaaS vendors is figure out how do we drive awareness of the gap that users actually have? Because they may not be interested in this new application because all they see is the effort to learn it and to change. They don't see how it's going to benefit them in the long run. Todd, we've had a lot of good discussion about uh, monthly active usage that, you know, everybody defines it a little bit differently. Is that actually the thing that our customers have cared about? You've talked about awareness and helping a customer actually make their users aware of the full value prop of what we're doing. What else would you want the audience to know today? Is there, they're looking through 2024 planning. They're saying, okay, how am I going to get my customers to do what I want them to do to, to see the value in renewing again with, with us? What, what, what are the last bits of advice do you have? Yeah. Well, again, I would say Mao is a lagging indicator, meaning once it's there, then it oftentimes is going to correlate well to renewal. But what makes Mao occur is the thing that we oftentimes don't understand. And so a customer's winning, but we don't know why they're winning or they're losing and we don't know why they're losing. So I think that I would, I would summarize it like this, where, where we really need to start is, as I, I kind of started this at the beginning, we need to look a little bit deeper into understanding what's the, what's the anticipated value that a user wants to get. Um, then the second thing is, does our product, is our product capable of delivering that value? And then third is how hard is it going to be for them to unlock that value? So if you can't paint a vision of where they're going to go, ensure that your product can get them to that vision and make it feel easy for them to get there, then you're not going to get the mouth that you want. And, and so as a result, if you think about it from that lens and you think about what are the things that are stopping my customer from seeing the vision, it could be a whole lot of different things. Maybe it is a combative, a combative CEO. Right. And that's totally out of your control or a, mostly out of your control. Uh, and, and so you need to understand what those things are. Maybe there was a, a massive layoff that's causing people to feel discouraged and they don't want to make any changes. Or maybe that maybe there's, a, you know, a, a new influx of funding and that's causing people to feel excited. Maybe there's a new regulatory issues that are making people nervous or afraid that it's going to get them fired if they do something wrong. So if you don't, if you don't, like I said, if you're not willing to really dig in and take inventory and stock with the customer, you're going to really struggle. So I guess I would, I would summarize that all by saying what you need to do is you need to pair the, the, the key metrics of things that you want the customer to do with that pre-work to understand what the vision is, what, how they feel about the product and its ability to deliver and the effort it's going to take to get them there. So like, don't just look at Mao. You need to pair it with qualitative information. Ask great, uh, ask great questions to your, uh, to your points of contact, to your administrator to really peel those layers back. Figure out how to get feedback from end users. Um, and, you know, don't just send them some external survey or hound them constantly about NPS score and, and CSAT inside of your application. Those things aren't going to help you move the needle. You need to take that layer deeper and really understand how users are thinking and, and what they're trying to accomplish. And if you can do that, then you can craft the right message to really help them get where they need to go. Uh, solid. This is a, a masterclass today. Um, one other bit of advice, again, if, if your manager is just hounding you on monthly active usage, one of the things that I've seen work really well is, is just a, just a simple, um, aspect of, Hey, why did we, why did we purchase this product? You know, what led you to purchase this product? Well, we wanted X, X and X value. Okay. In order to get X, X, X value, what features in our applications do your users need to utilize? And so sometimes just doing that little flip, right? And saying, okay, why did we buy this? 
we wanted users to do these behavior changes. Okay, for those be behavior changes to take place, what features in the application would they actually have to use? Oh, these ones. Okay, let's now create a communication campaign or awareness campaign and get them down that road. So sometimes it's just maybe reversing the order. Sometimes maybe we lead with Mal and hope for business realization. What if we led with business realization and said, okay, what features now inside the software do we have to utilize to then get to where we want to go? So Todd, this yeah. is fantastic. Thank you, man. Yeah, of course. Just remember, Mal is, Mal is an outcome of other activities. It's not a it's not a predictor of future activities, and that is the big barrier that I think uh, uh, that we need to that, or that's the uh, that's the misconception that we need to change in the market. And if we can yep. do that, then I think we'll be in a way better position to support our customers. So that's I think our charge today when it comes to thinking about you know we always want to give you homework on on these podcasts. I think it's important for you to take. Uh, a real introspective look. Don't be fearless uh, to to kind of search and take inventory of where you're actually at and how you're doing at this. Are you allowing Mao to tell a story that it's not? Meaning, are you allowing Mao mm -hmm. to be your uh, your indicator for success without understanding why you're achieving that success? And if if that's really where you're at as a business, then it's important to really try to flip that on its head. And identify, are, do we know what they need to get, the vision they need to have, the product and features they need to use, and the effort they need to actually use those? Have we really looked at, at fixing that first? And if we have, that's whenever we're going to be able to get to them out. But ultimately, we're going to know what drove that success. It's awesome, Todd. I think, I think we saved some relationships today. I hope so. Hey, everybody, stay, uh, stay focused on how you can uh, improve yourself and, and improve, your, improve your relationship with your customers. And we hope you have a great rest of your week. Thanks, everyone. Bye.